Hello audience. I've been made aware of some recent comments here on the channel, essentially revolving around the criticism of how is Daniel supposed to be taken seriously when he doesn't even take himself or his own content seriously. He's reviewing these books when he's just a giant joke. And you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. And I promise I'll buckle down and make things here on the channel a bit more serious, a bit more respect of, uh, I tucked my pants into my socks again, didn't I? Damn it, Daniel, how's anyone gonna take you seriously now? Anyway, I guess we can't recover from this. We have a lightsaber here for a mic holder, ha <laughs> ha! Oh right, it's not a real lightsaber. Damn it. Why is it a lightsaber and not a sword? Well, we're talking sci-fi. We're not gonna be doing the typical fantasy roundabout for a before you read. We're going into the other side of that SFF label and jumping into the ideas of humanity's place in the broader universe, which is one of the major themes of the story we're talking about here today, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini. Full disclosure, I was sent this book early, I reviewed it here on the channel, I interviewed Christopher, and I thought it was a really good book. It's not the greatest sci-fi epic ever, but in terms of having a really solid balance between mass appeal while still staying true to the sci-fi roots, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, kind of knocks it out of the park. And we're going to talk about in depth here today, the appeal of the story, the basic setup, get into not spoilers, but initiating incidents and what the story is trying to do from there. And you can judge in this before you read whether or not to sleep in a sea of stars is something you want to read. So look at this cover. We have a woman falling through space, kind of going like, <laughs> and this immediately begs the question of why? Why is she floating through space? Is this just kind of being a metaphorical representation of the themes of the story? Or is it a more direct, this is a scene that happens? The answer, yeah. So the initiating incidents here, we are following a xenobiologist named Kira, K-I-R-A, my dyslexia couldn't even screw that one up, hell yeah. As she encounters in the first little bit here in the initiating incident, an alien light form that changes her life forever. And this alien life form is a symbiote. It latches onto her, waiting for God knows how long to find a new host. They become one, and she must learn to live with this alien attached to her. Now I know what you're thinking. Another typical symbiote relationship where the person gets super powered and control. No, no, no. This is a pretty complex and hard to manage symbiote to human relationship. There is automation to this suit, borderline intelligence. I'll let you figure that one out on your own. And this whole story is about a growing level of communication between the two that is complicated by immediate stakes and ramifications for finding this alien in the first place. They are personal to grand. And that is one of the biggest interesting points of this story here. I can't touch on any more because I don't want to get too deep into book spoilers here, but this is about a xenobiologist making contact with an alien life form that becomes a part of her and takes so, so much away. But you know, it also gives her like super badass powers and she can like shape shift it into various stuff with her mind. It's maybe the most well-realized like form of this kind of symbiote I've seen in science fiction. And I've seen more than a few of these. We are now experiencing first contact. Well, not actually first contact. That's a little detail that's sprinkled in there. They've encountered alien artifacts before, but this is like, alien artifact with like a alien leftover life form thing. And we go from there. And this kind of rapidly disintegrates into, wow, first contact, that's great. Oh, they are hostile. Oh, sh And so we have an action-packed space opera adventure. I would say there are many likenesses from this into Halo, Star Wars, but there's also several things hearkening to older states of science fiction as well. Many thoughtful musings on the place of humanity in the world, many deep dives into our own maturity as a species and how that could play into a downfall between us and relationship to other societies out there. I found the pacing of this story to be very rapid. It has some real halts, but usually in those halts, Christopher's trying to build up and pad his characters as well. It's a bit choppy in that aspect, but overall, towards the end, it blended quite well. And something else you must know before you get into this story, it's the start of something bigger. 
Daniel, what do you mean? Yes, it's not just that humanity as a whole is coming into first contact in the sense of something bigger, but in the meta to this book, it's the start of something bigger Christopher Paolini is trying to tell. Power Stance. The Fractalverse. A Cosmere almost-esque equivalent that our man here, the author of The Inheritance Cycle, is beginning to spin on out. And so this book, this Goliath that almost rivals like a Sanderson rhythm of war and page count has a big ambition where it's trying to invest you as the reader, not just in the story happening now, but the situation, political climate and circumstances of the broader context of the place of humanity and these characters. So that you'll come back for other stories, not necessarily following these same people and the same events or even time, but just the bigger story of this fractal verse. Christopher has confirmed this is supposed to be our world, which means Christopher, you exist in this universe, as do I. Are you going to go full Stephen King? Are we going to get an author cameo in their own fictional universe? We don't know. As I did mention here, I think there are many similarities to the storytelling of well-known sci-fi franchises. Sci-fi is an incestuous genre. There's a lot of pulling different ideas from each other through authors, and this is no different. You're going to read this and say, oh, this has similarities to X, Y, and Z, but what you don't realize is those X, Y, and Z, if you're not well read in sci-fi, have many other similarities to other sci-fi stories told before them. What Christopher has accomplished, though, is blending them in this giant stew quite well, and I would say to an effective result that is fairly unique and actually quite the tantalizing investment. I can see myself being pulled into the fractal verse as a whole. Whether it's like, oh yeah, that's a little Mass Effect-y and that's a little Halo-y, this is a little Star Trek-y and that's a little Star Wars-y, but when you put them together, it's a little fractal verse -y. But something that often gives me a little bit of the before I pick up a book when I hear an author's trying to launch something larger is, okay, you're gonna put a lot of effort into making this bigger thing, but are you actually gonna succeed in telling the story within this book itself? Because many people, when they try to set something else up bigger, I'm looking at you, DCEU, they forget that they need to tell a self-contained story that's still well worth the read just here in this book. Could you just pick up to sleep in a sea of stars and be satisfied with this journey without feeling the need, without wanting to go on into the broader fractal verse? And that's actually one of the most impressive successes here within To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. I think 1000% yes, because Christopher does set up this bigger landscape, but each and every single beat of it, every element introduced, still serves a purpose to this story. You don't get Get the literary equivalent of like that cave scene with Thor in Age of Ultron where it's like, why the hell is this happening? No, no, no. Every single scene serves a purpose for this narrative and it never feels like it's wasting your time. To Sleep in a Sea of Stars as a whole also has a very impressive reliance on real science. This is scientific papers in the back of the book level. Yes, Christopher did his research and everything here is something we know can technologically be done to theoretically is possible. Except for one thing involving that alien encounter at the beginning that's kind of debatable, but you know, creative liberties. My criticisms do come down to it's a little bit indulgent with the page count. It could be trimmed here or there, but with sci-fi, that's to be expected. <laughs> we get that a lot of the time here. I also wasn't 100% thrilled with the very ending. And I think it'll be polarizing among fans, but it's not a deal breaker at all. The most impressive accomplishment here from Christopher is I think he really landed home with what he set out to do. The pacing's not perfect, the characters are not the best of all time, but I really see a very firm root foundation for the Fractalverse, and the story itself is enticing enough for me to recommend to anyone who's curious about getting into broader modern sci-fi space fantasy epics. And the appeal is definitely strong enough for anyone looking into modern sci-fi to sleep in a sea of stars would be a very solid starting point. You also kind of have the natural option from there of, oh, I'll continue on with this series, or no, that was a good introduction, but I'm just gonna go over here as well. Now, I will note, this is still Christopher Paolini's writing style. He has definitely improved in many technical aspects, but if you've read Inheritance, you know how Christopher writes, and this isn't like he's somehow coming out of the shadows with an all new form. No, he's not changing up his boxing style. It's still his style, but he's definitely more technically foundational 
really solid, stronger than ever. Some other criticisms, not Tad William level pros and somewhat predictable at times, but with how tantalizing the story is and how cool so many of the concepts are on face value, you're gonna not care that much because, okay, sci-fi again, just has when it's well executed, the advantage of like, that's an amazing idea based in real science and I wanna think about it and talk about it for hours, please. Oh, this book's gonna do that, great. And I'm extremely happy that Christopher is having this level of success of a story uh, for his kind of return to the sci-fi fantasy community. I mean, I think a lot of us are very invested in him as an author because because of how influential he was for many of us getting into the genre and kind of just seeing this return. I don't know, it just feels like having someone return to the party after a while, it's it's a nice feeling. So my concluding thoughts here for To Sleep in a Sea of Stars are this is going to be one I'm really interested to see the audience reaction to. It's trying to set up something bigger than itself and still represents itself quite well. It falls into the genre of space operas, which is widely popular, but still has many of the harder sci-fi elements behind it and is deeply based in real science. To Sleep in a Sea of Stars in like a minute pitch is this grand epic sci-fi space opera launching this something bigger while telling a self-contained story that's satisfactory. It's not the deepest or most nuanced of all time, but it's fun. It's got a lot of very cool ideas and it pulls many of the best elements from successful stories told before while transforming it all into something of its own. So let me know what you think of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Are you gonna pick it up? There's a link of course in the description for you to do so. And are you excited to get your hands on this Goliath of a book? Because dear God, this is a thick book. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.